Um, so, as Asta said, uh, my name is Jason, and um, I run a company called The Swarm that's based in London. We do um, content strategy and design in the digital space. Um, it's a company I started after I left um, the BBC, where I ran BBC Mobile for three and a half years, and was a commissioner on different parts of the website before that, and ran The Economist's website um, for a few years before that. So my whole um, career, my whole background has been working in the digital content design space. <coughs> um, first on PC, then moving on to mobile. And um, one of the things when Asta and I started talking about prototyping was um, one of the things I got to thinking is that the places I've worked have been very good at prototyping with technology um, and are very good at prototyping with code. But content makers, content creators are less um, engaged with the idea of prototyping, less engaged with um, taking risks and trying to make things new ways, different ways. You know, you don't see um, a newspaper decide to do an article in a different way. News articles run the same way every day. News bulletins on TV run the same way. A documentary, you know what you're going to get. There's a very certain pattern that's put together for most um, TV media anyway. Film, cinema, film is a uh, a bit different. And <clears throat> so what I started thinking about was how do we um, bring this world of connected objects where there's lots of prototyping going on, lots of techno technological advancement going on, and try and apply that with content. And so I'm going to take you through a little bit of a talk about that today. Um, and what I've tried to do is think of what-if scenarios um, for what if we could create this type of narrative experience or this type of media experience. And what I've tried to do is keep them quite realistic, right? So I didn't want to say, what if we could beam ourselves to the moon or that type of a thing. So if at first some of them seem like very everyday and not you know, things that are going to break your brain, um, that's because I was trying to look for what could we prototype that would actually be accessible and actually be usable and something that your average media consumer could take up. So I'm not sure um, the level of knowledge in the space. Um, I'm also, I've taken a huge cultural risk in the presentation. Um, do people in Sweden know who these guys are? Yes, thing one and thing two. Okay, good. Whew. I was afraid that no one might know. So um, what this is a very crude representation of is the fact um, and a lot of people don't know this, but forgive me if you do, that there are a greater number of things on the internet than there are people in most Western countries. So the, the wireless networks have more things connecting. And when I say things, I mean sensors primarily, um, you know, geolocation tags, um, connected health devices, etc. And they're sending data all over the place, back and forth in the environment. And they're talking to each other um, just the same way that people do, right? We, we, we send data from our phones all the time. We send data from our uh, computers and all the rest of it. And so people are on the internet. Things are on the internet. But they're kind of having two separate conversations, right? Because if you're a city, um, and you've got all of your buses connected in, that's probably talking to a central command. But is it actually talking to the people yet? Not so much. And I think that world is starting to come, but I don't think it's quite there yet. So what I started thinking about is what types of media experiences could we create when we connect people with these things and the data that's coming out of them, that kind of silent conversation, as they call it, with the environment around us. <coughs> Um, we're starting to see some really great services that are creating sort of interoperability and the very beginning of content experiences in, in that space. So um, over here on the left, we have Nike Plus, which is a sensor that you can put into your shoe. It senses the pace, and I think it senses your heart rate as well. And it adjusts the music that you're listening to on your iPod so that it paces itself with um, your workout when you're running or when you're at the gym. Etc. So that's beginning to change, use biofeedback a little bit on that sort of music listening experience you have. And then over here we see um, a device that's um, like a pop-up dashboard from a car that runs apps the same way that a smartphone or a tablet might. And we're just at the beginning of starting to see um, content experiences that are tailored to 
where you are and what you're doing. And so we're seeing, you know, not just a mobile device in the car, but the car itself becomes connected and the car becomes part of that media experience for the people that are in there. And an example of that is an app that I've been working on for the last few years called Sunday Drive, um, which is based in America. And it um, senses where you are and it gives you alternative ways of driving on your route based on the most scenic way of getting there rather than the most direct or the fastest or the least traffic blocked way. So it's just trying to think about how can we use the location of the car, how can we connect it with the world around, and how can we meet a need for the people that are consuming it. Um, but I still think that this isn't necessarily, the, the, those types of experiences, they're great, but I don't think that they're at the point where we're really looking at what is the type of media experience that's native to the Internet of Things. What is the actual type of, you know, this is creating interoperability. So if we think about that in terms of the web, I don't know, did anyone actually get to see this when it was live? Amazon's original homepage? Okay, so Amazon did an amazing thing, right? It connected anyone who wanted to buy books with the biggest bookstore in the world. And that was great. But it wasn't actually giving you books on the internet, right? It still gave you books that you held and you, you read with paper. Um, and then they moved on and they brought out the Kindle and other people have brought out e-readers. And that's really great too because that's actually putting the book in your hand digitally. So that's a, a step of uh, making that interoperability more native to the mobile media, more native to the internet. But where you really see a step change in the book world is when you start to look at enhanced books, right? These enhanced books on a tablet actually take advantage of the specific interaction patterns that you can have on a touchscreen device. It takes advantage of the media player. It takes advantage of the graphical capabilities and the processing speed in a way that a book on a Kindle is still very much like a paper book replicated. So what I'm trying to think of is what are the experiences that we can make that are actually really suited to these connected devices, Internet of Things world. Um, and one of the things, this, th this might be a little bit academic, but one of the things that I've talked about when I've talked about this before is this idea of creating story systems that create value for the users. As content makers, um, People like myself have grown up in a world where you write an article, it gets edited, it gets sent to press, and it doesn't change. You know exactly what every single line of the article is going to look like, exactly what the page is going to look like. You know exactly what your uh, video clip or your film is going to be like because you put it in the can and no one can change it. And I think one of the things that content makers, as they start thinking about prototyping new forms of content, have to do is start to think about how do they let go of some of that control and allow the content and context out there to create meaning for the users, regardless of the device and the situation. And that's a really hard thing to do because you have to completely rethink the way that you're presenting that content, the way you're creating it, and thinking through different ways that people might actually consume it outside of your complete and utter control. Um, <clears throat> in terms of, uh, you know, th th this isn't rocket science, but I wanted to create a little bit of a framework for the what-if scenarios that I'm going to talk through. So I started thinking really big, and thinking about connected environment, the you know, biggest, most distant kind of um, experiences. And then the idea of connected objects in your home. Connected devices that are your personal devices, we all know those, right? These, e-readers, etc. And then the idea of a connected body, or um, a term that I heard the other day, uh, wireless body area network, so the connectivity that's kind of immediately around you, um, or what some people have called cyborg, um, which is where people and machine actually start to merge. And um, you know, there's very beginnings of that happening in the research world. Some of the universities are starting to prototype contact lenses that actually can send and receive data and put data in your field of vision. So that's where our bodies and the technology actually come right up against each other. And I started thinking about what are some of these what-if media experiences that I would like to see prototyped or I would like um, people to try prototyping as we go forward. So thinking about connected environment, um, one of the things that I was thinking um, is wouldn't it be great if um, it was going to rain? Now, I'm one of these people, I never check the weather because I know in London it's always going to be horrible. Um, but I still never remember to take an umbrella, even though I know I should. So I was thinking, 
why don't I check the weather? And it's because, well, I don't want to go and turn on the computer and go to the BBC website and type in my postcode. And I'm, I'm rushing in the morning, right? So I thought, wouldn't it be really cool if my umbrella was connected to a feed of data that was coming from the weather report because it knew my location, it could start beeping at me in the morning when I need to get it on the way out the door. Totally, totally doable if someone wants to make that. And that's a whole different way of getting your weather report in a connected environment. And potentially more useful than just seeing an icon of rain. Um, not that that's a bad thing, but um, yeah. So then um, I started thinking a little bit closer to home. And I started thinking about um, objects that people uh, that we have around our home and what that it would be like if some of the media devices around us could sense more about what we're doing, more about what we needed in terms of content, entertainment, et cetera. And um, I've, you know, I, I've, I've loved the idea of this for a while, and I've raised it a few times. And the amazing thing is that someone has actually done this now. Um, I just saw it last week, but I kept the slides in. And the best news for you guys is he's coming tomorrow. So you'll get to actually see this um, in real life. But I thought, what if your TV could use, could read your facial expressions when you're watching a horror movie, or read your brain waves to see how emotionally scared you are, and adjust the scariness of the movie so that you could have the Blair Witch Project, the kind of scary version, the Blair Witch Project, the brings tears to your eyes version, or the Blair Witch Project makes you completely scream version. Um, and that you could watch it different times and get different outcomes depending on how you reacted to it. So maybe the first time it makes you completely scream, but then after you've watched it 15 times with your friends and you laugh at how kind of kitschy it is, um, you only get the medium scary version. And then you know the entertainment experience could change every time. And it could be, you know, you'd still have a linear narrative of the story, but the kind of ambiance and the, the, the um, extent to which the emotional impact is taken could be adjusted and personalized to you or to the group of people that you're watching it with. Um, thinking again about TV and what if TVs had more sort of sensing capability, um, I started thinking about these you know, amazing uh, natural history documentaries uh, na or natural world documentaries that um, everyone loves. And they have loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of footage that gets shot for them. And then it gets cut down into a 52 minute series and all of this, or a 52 minute episode or a series of 52 minute episodes. And all of this footage goes by the wayside, all of this extra content. Um, and so I thought, what if, again, using either facial recognition or some form of biofeedback, brainwaves, whatever, um, and there are tools to do this that are out there, they're just not being used that much, um, or they're brand new. What if um, a really long series like Planet Earth could adjust its length based on how much attention you were giving it, so that as it started to sense that you were getting bored, it could start to shorten itself down to your time period. Or if it noticed that your heart rate was going up because you were getting anxious because you knew you had to pick the kids up from school or something, it could again adjust its time. But if you were really, really relaxed in the recliner with a glass of red wine with your feet up, it could just go on all night because the amount of footage that they would have shot for that is phenomenal. And then I thought, what about when um, the ocean sunfish comes on? That's my favorite animal, by the way. Um, and that's important to the, while we're talking about this. And I go, oh, it's the ocean sunfish, I love them. It could give me a deep dive, no pun intended, view all about all of the footage and extended footage about that particular topic or that particular interest that I have, and then resume back into the main narrative of the story and take me on. Um, if you did that, it would completely personalize what people were watching in a way that we haven't seen before. And there's huge content questions about how you create that s experience seamlessly um, and how you would craft that and get the technology to work with it. But <clears throat> I think it's something that we need to start trying. The other thing is, um, if you did that, how many times could you watch Planet Earth without getting a repeat? It's probably infinite. And it would probably mean that everyone who watched it would have a slightly different experience and be able to take away a slightly different story that's more meaningful and more personal to them. Um, then I started thinking about, uh, again, I was trying to think about really mainstream type of entertainment, mainstream types of shows, so I thought about cooking shows, and I thought, what could we do here? Because 
Um, one thing that I knew when I was at the BBC was that cooking and food shows were hugely popular on mobile because people can take them into take the portable devices into the kitchen with them, which sounds really simple, but um, we didn't quite expect that when we started doing it. Um, and so I started thinking about, well, not every recipe that you get is completely suited to everyone, right? Like I don't eat wheat very often, and so a lot of those recipes might, you know, that I see on TV, I go, well, I can't do that. And, but what if somehow um, you know, the, the recipes that you see on cooking shows could be adapted based on your biofeedback to give you a recipe that was particularly suited. Or even notice that maybe, uh-oh, your blood pressure is a little bit high today. Maybe we'll half the salt in that before you have dinner so that you don't get even more anxious. You know, these can be very simple little things, but again, it comes back to personalization as, because now we're really thinking about connected body and taking feedback from what we're doing. Um, the next one's a little bit more futuristic, um, but um, if you're thinking, has, has, do people know about Google Glass? The glasses that Google have that, right, so I started thinking what could you do with that or these contact lenses that people are trying to do with a different content experience that wasn't just the cash point is over there, taxis over there. Oh, okay, okay, I got a lot of hands so I thought, okay, so for those who don't know, um, Google Glass is a pair of glasses that can take data from the internet and superimpose it into your field of vision on the glasses. So if you don't know where the nearest um, bank is or you don't know where the taxi queue is um, or you need to find the train station, it can direct you to that. So if people have seen augmented reality before where you kind of hold your phone up and do this, it makes you, you look less stupid than doing this and you wear a pair of glasses that look pretty stupid because they were designed by Google and not by designers. But they're pretty, they're cool, they just don't look as cool as I think the guys at Google maybe think. So I started thinking, you know, what could we do with TV with that type of technology? And um, so I started thinking about my favorite uh, series, True Blood, with a, you know, homegrown Swedish hero for you. Um, and I thought, what if you were watching a show and um, you know, you could pause the action and watch different subplots for different characters and then come back to the main narrative. And the thing that I wanted to, to really point out with that, that's why I have this very overly cute looking couple up here, is that people like watching TV together. And, you know, sometimes when we get into these personal experiences, we end up actually siloing people into these very narrow experiences that they can't share. And so what I was thinking about was a sort of user journey where they're watching, um, it pauses for a little bit, they go off and on their personal devices, their personal screens that only they can see, they watch a subplot about their characters. And then they have time to still have that communal TV experience where they discuss it and resume the main part of the story. So <coughs> that's my kind of what ifs scenarios um, for you. And this is just one more thing I wanted to show you. It's a tool that's um, available if anyone wants to use it in the prototyping party or Otherwise, um, it's called Galahad, and it's a system for transmedia storytelling, storytelling across platforms and across destinations online using various media. And um, it lets you create entire online story worlds, but the part that I thought was particularly interesting in this case was thinking about um, this, which is called the immersive video player. Um, and I'm not actually going to show you because it'll, it'll take too long right now. But what it allows you to do is create <coughs> um, stories, narratives, and let the user make choices by clicking within the video. And you don't need to create a flash movie to do that. You just use your kind of normal video production skills and then assemble it. And you can allow for people to work through layers like they do in a game. So you bring in kind of gaming theory. You can create multiple outcomes. So uh, you can build logic in so that people have to do things in certain orders in order to get the achievements that you want them to. So it really kind of brings video, gaming, and multi-threaded narrative together in a way that I think is really, really unique and exciting. And I'd encourage you to go and check this out. It's from a company called The Shadow Gang that we helped uh, design this with them. And um, so thank you very much for your time. Let's take a couple of questions for Jason. Yes, we got the lady down there. Do we have the mic? No? 
Anyway, I don't know if it works. Does it? Okay. Um, there, is, there is the other side of the story, which might not, I mean, you never know with innovations where they will end up, do you really? I mean, the intentions are great, but what about people that really don't want their body to, to be the one who is dictating what they are or not supposed to do? There is a free mind as well, and the body has its own language. So th there is an opposite, might be trend eventually, I really don't know. So how do you take under consideration this? Well, I think, you know, no one has to do it. No one's going to hold you down and sort of drill, you know, nanobots into your head or anything like that. Um, I, th I think it's a matter of, as part of the prototyping, prototyping the security and the privacy issues around that and making sure that those experiences um, and those services are solid and in place before people get involved. And I think, but I think you're right. People do want private time and they do want time when they're not disrupted. And, you know, the trend is kind of already there. You hear about people going off the grid um, and uh, like intentionally leaving all devices behind and going away for a weekend. Or um, I don't know if, if anyone has seen on the iPhone 5, there's actually a do not disturb button with a little like sort of crescent moon. And you just switch that off and it takes you off. You know, nothing can bother you. Well, nothing from the iPhone 5 can bother you at that point. You know, partners, children, falling trees, any of these things can. But um, I think you're right. And I think it's definitely something um, that needs to be addressed, but probably by someone who's much smarter than I am and who knows a lot more about security and privacy <laughs> issues than I do. But yeah, it's, it's a very say, good uh, point. I say one thing that we figured out with interactive museums, because we had the same problem when we started doing that, that you had an audience who wants to go to a museum to be offline to be left alone. Um, now I'm being a bit rude, we call them the grey helmets. Uh, it's mostly elderly ladies who goes to museum, that's the economic base. And they really don't want interactivity, a lot of them. They do it with their grandchildren, but for the museum experience, they want to be left alone together with a friend, enjoy something. So what we did there, because we also needed the school classes to have something they wanted to do there, but we also needed a younger audience start going to museums again. So we created interactive experiences that didn't disturb the normal target group. So a lot of these things will probably be modular, where you can choose to do it, but you don't have to. So you have your basic social experience, and there are different modules you can choose to do or not to do. And a lot of them will be centered around social situations much more than technology. So it's more, more going to feel more like that you facilitate a communication. Yeah, I th yeah, I think that's a, a really good point. You know, it does have to be an opt-in. And with any of these media experiences I was kind of describing, I would imagine there's a default by which the show just plays or the weather report just comes without knowing where you are. And, you know, all of... So, so these are sort of layers built on top of what's existing already. We got a question from Jay, and then we got a couple questions down there. We need a mic. Um, I'd like to ask a historical question. About 20 years ago, uh, Xerox Park, uh, Mark Weiser, uh, developed a, a concept that he called ubiquitous computing. Mm -hmm. And some of it sounded f familiar or, or similar to some of the suggestions you were make, the notion, uh, making, the notion that computers would be embedded and networked and embedded in the environment. They would talk to each other. They would try to anticipate your needs and so on. The umbrella uh, reminded me of, of you know, the idea that he had that your refrigerator would look at you know, your food situation and tell you when it was time to go to the store or even do the ordering. Mm -hmm. And it might be actually the inverse of the last question is, have we reached a point, uh, what's different now? Uh, have we reached a point where the culture is ready to accept that degree of um, connectivity with the machines? Have the machines evolved? Um, do you think we're at a different moment now than we were 20 years ago? Um, it's, there's definitely a similarity with uh, what he talked about with ubiquitous computing. I mean, I think it's almost another name for Internet of Things. Um, there's potentially some slight differences in that, I think, and I'd have to go back and consult my textbooks where I read about this, excuse me, where I read about this stuff. I think with ubiquitous computing, he was thinking about actual computing devices being embedded in everything, whereas with the Internet of Things, it's slightly wider because it would include anything that's addressable. So something with an RFID tag or a QR code suddenly has an addressable point on the internet. And I think that might not have been within his thinking. But there's definitely a level of overlap and inspiration that's come there. Um, I forgot the second part of your question. Oh, the cultural moment. I think, okay, so I think one of the biggest things that's changed is the networks. 
there has to be enough bandwidth on the mobile networks for this stuff to happen, and data has to be able to trans travel fast enough for this to happen. And I mean, it's still hard, right? I mean, um, in our office in London, sometimes we can't get a mobile signal at all, never mind fast mobile data. <laughs> so, you know, you wouldn't want to have like your, I don't know, connected trainers giving you directions to the shop and like suddenly lose connectivity and go, oh, I don't know where I'm going now, right? We've all had that thing with Google Maps probably, right? Where you go, oh, I'll use Google Maps. Ah, uh, no, but no signal. But it probably doesn't happen in Sweden though. Um, but it certainly happens in England. Um, I also think that's one interesting thing with your question because I remember the first experimental homes in Denmark were 15 years ago where the fridge could order itself, uh, they read who com came through the door. And I think at that point, they really tried to sell it to people, <coughs> and especially to the elderly. And they found out people were scared. And then start coming an evolution where we changed it into being more kind of, the interface got more humane, especially, a lot of you probably heard about the seal robots that use for elderly people who needs contact or who's got some kind of sickness where they can't communicate with the external world. And first they actually wanted to do this robot into a cat or a dog, but people know what a cat and a dog look like, so they didn't take it seriously. So instead they did it as a seal, because we all seen pictures of baby seals, but very few people had really sat down with a baby seal. Uh, so now we got robots that are more kind of um, connected to what you as a human would feel like that experience. And the intelligent home is moving forward, probably because more people are now um, familiar with the technology. A lot of the stuff we do together, we really take care of the technical barrier because we know if we need a lot of people to do this, they need to know the tools and the interfaces. And for example, now everybody knows Swipe, so that's a pretty one easy one to use. So I think it's also about the whole kind of audience group getting used to it and seeing technology as a tool um, so they're not frightened of it anymore. Let's take some more questions. We got lots of time. Joa, you had a question? Yeah, hi. Oh, oh hi. sorry. <laughs> Uh, I was just uh, thinking uh, your reflection on why this has taken so long. Um, I mean, I saw your last example there of uh, personalized, personalized TV shows and so on. And I mean, 25 years ago, I had loads of adventure books where I could just uh, select my own uh, ending or the story outcome. Mm -hmm. And I mean, in 25 years, it's taken us to come to this. And you say it's even in the future. I mean, why is it taking so long? I mean, other fields of the digitaliz digitalization in 25 years, we've, we've come so much further. Why is this taking so long? I, th I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that media companies are in a very precarious place right now, financially, and have been for a, a while. They're seeing profits dwindling, and when com organizations see profits dwindling, they become uh, more risk-averse and they don't want to take a lot of chances. And you know the way that media uh, makes money is generally through things becoming very popular and very mainstream. And so there's always this nervousness of like, oh, what happens if we make something that's technologically scary to people and it bombs and we've spent millions and millions of dollars on it? And that's why I think there's a need to kind of work in this prototyping space um, to try and see what does really work and suit audiences. Um, because I think you're right, it does, um, it, you know, it, it does feel like it's taking a long time. Game shows still look like game shows. Cooking shows still look like cooking shows. Um, and we're not seeing the kind of evolution there that we're seeing on the web or in, you know, cars or, uh, you know, other fields. Uh, there is one theory right now that is that most people who do media don't get very close to their audience because the distribution is digital or via a screen or where, for example, museums and educations have been working much more in this field because they're simply closer to the users. So they see they have another behavior. We also talk about something, I talked a lot with uh, Swiss TV about this. They're, they're a very institution with a lot of money, but they got three cultural uh, areas within them. So they have the same problem if broadcasters work together like Denmark, Amsterdam, France, a lot of cultural changes uh, and borders. Uh, but they said, it's a problem that I bought doesn't have anyone young enough to have a grandchild. Because then they would play together on the iPad, and then they would know we need to have some iPad <coughs> experiences with a broadcast. So it's also about the group of people who makes the decisions in the media. M some of them might be outside that area where they actually meet users doing this. But we see it a lot in museums, we see it a lot in art, we see it where people meet their audience. We see this happening faster than the other areas. 
Yeah, this is a question that uh, relates to the first one, I think. Um, I'm sure we're all familiar with the filter bubble of search engines and um, the constant vendor lock-in. So I was wondering about these uh, feedback technologies presenting choices to you based on your biofeedback if you wouldn't have a risk of the kind of cho first choice lock-in. So if I, for example, choose a dish that decides what the next dish presented to me will be, which will then very limit my choice for exploration for things I don't know yet. Um, I'm sure this has come up plenty of times with this topic anyway. But I, you know, I, I think it's a good question. Um, wh how do you keep people out of being siloed through personalization is always um, an issue. Every project I've ever worked on where there's personalization involved, ha you know, it's how do you make them see you know, discover new things, and that, that's always an issue. I think it comes back to what I was saying before about the fact that you could have the personalized and non-personalized version of these things, right? We're not going to stop it and force you and say, you need to give a blood sample to your TV right now so we can tell you what to cook. We're going to say, this cooking show is on. If you use, not blood sample, you know, whatever um, extra technology, then we can give you an enhanced experience. But there's always got to be that default layer of sit back, lean back, watch and enjoy what's here. The main worry for me is that with search engines, as the example, most people are not aware of it, so it's kind of an invisible filter for them. That they yeah. are, you know, so that's the thing with this thing as well. If it's ubiquitous, um, even if it's opt-in, it might have some kind of invisible... It might have opt-in, or it might have a responsible design where it says, now reading your heartbeat, right? I mean, search engines do it invisibly because they want to. They could, you know, Google could say, we gave you this, these search rankings because you've searched for these things previously. They just choose not to. Um, you just know, like uh, on, um, y y you know, you see recommendation engines where it says, because you liked these things or because you purchased these things, you may also like these things. And then you start to understand, ah, okay, this isn't actually creepy. It's just based on some logic. And that doesn't feel as weird. I don't think. I was actually thinking, Hans, could you tell a little about, about that? Because then we get into peer-to-peer -peer recommendation, which is much less scary than a system. And you have a lot of experience with that. Just give people an explanation about who you are very shortly. Uh, I'm Hans von Knut. I'm from uh, Portsmouth. We do a lot of uh, interactive products and design. I'm uh, from Copenhagen. Uh, what, what you're talking about there is actually, well, the worst challenge isn't the whole recommendation system. The worst challenge with the recommendation system and also with this whole ubiquitous computing thing is the, the device and system fragmentation. That right now Amazon can only look at the last book you bought and the other stuff you bought at them. So, so I mean, it's like you get some recommendations, but they're pretty far off. The same way with, with the umbrella that is connected to the, to the weather forecast. Well, that's easy to do, but can also be connected to the tsunami warning system, for example. You need uh, more than an umbrella for a tsunami. Come on. Yeah, but then it could say, "Don't pick me. <laughs> you, that, I'm not enough." <laughs> uh, the whole point is the biscuit <laughs> computing thing was was centered around that you have one central computer, one central system with all info in it. That's also the intelligent home. Then, along the way, came device fragmentation, competing systems, competing standards. Now we have a shitload of data and a shitload of devices, and none of them talk together. So the the worst challenge or the greatest challenge for this whole idea of, of connectivity is basically a fragmentation of systems. And this of course also counts for this whole interactive storytelling. If you don't have one standard for interactive movies, then nobody will dare to do it. And even if you have it, when you fragment your content, it gets more expensive to do. So nobody dares and so on. So I mean, yeah, I think the whole the worst challenge is actually that it's hard to do right now more than what we can do about it. But, well, that's kind of trivial to say, sorry. But maybe that's also why we can see the whole makers movement that we hear more about tomorrow, that innovation actually happens a lot faster in small groups where people just do it. And then either some company buys it up or everybody goes, well, we got to do that. So I also think that we will see innovation coming from other ways than we used to. It used to be so that people 25 to 35 were technology drivers, they had money, they had time, they were tech savvy. Today a lot of the inventions, for example the SMS, is based on a much younger target group. So we will actually start seeing different drivers and very often younger ones or interest groups or passionate communities and especially 
the Creators Makers Movement, but more about that uh, tomorrow. So I'm just going to jump to one more question, and then we'll get more chairs Asper, there's in. one up here. Yeah, we had one here we've been waiting oh. for a while, so we'll take one here afterwards. Uh, well, it's, it's, a very, it's related to the previous questions, really. Um, what are your thoughts on who decides what technology desi is designed? And it's not so much about being able to switch it off necessarily, but in, you know, maybe you have a need, you have something that you want to develop, so that users aren't only passive, but they're active. Um, similar, say, to this movement of trying to get younger students to develop their own apps. So, you know, they don't just kind of download the app and use it as it is. They understand that they can actually develop an app and make it work for them, develop, you know, depending on their individual needs. Um, so I guess my question is about what your thoughts or what methods or processes we might need to involve users. That's a good question. I think... Um, the first thing, I mean, <coughs> you know, again, coming from a content background, I'm not an expert in te technology process. Um, I've worked with lots of on lots of technology projects with content. I think, um, you know, in terms of process, starting small and doing trials and testing them both technically, but also audience testing and user testing is really, really key. And understanding not just, you know, I press the button and it responds and I get three points. That's you know functional testing, that works. But understanding at a deeper, more human, emotional level, I press the button, that killed a character on the screen. Does that actually have the impact, the emotional impact, that me as the storyteller, want, or the I as the storyteller, want it to have? And then, yeah, so I, th and I think you know, there's words like co-creation, there's um, the traditional, traditional media focus groups that you can use, but I'm not sure I've got like a specific sort of process that I can point to and go, oh, it's that one. I don't think we got one. Uh, I think the ones who've been spending most money on this, Channel 4 and BBC, uh, China and, and Singapore really moving up into it now, what they've been saying the last couple of years is we don't know. So instead of you know, creating a huge project and launching it, they launch in modules. Because we find out that if we as designers or storytellers, we do an experience where we think this makes sense. I want to connect with you emotionally, tell you more about a character, make do your own choices in a gaming way. And then I put it out and you use it. And then you're going to use it in another way than I thought. And we see the same with interactive experiences in museums, which is a very physical space as well, that we put an emotional interactive experience out there and people use it differently. Sometimes they use it better. Sometimes it just it is good, but they used in another way. So no one of us knows what we know is it seems to work with interactive and connected experiences, but we have to do pilots, launch them, let people use them, and then people use them different way, and then we start creating more and more. So we talk about now that we only want to use like 30, 40 percent of a budget, building a framework, doing some specific experiences, then launching them and then actually adjusting and creating more content depending on what the users do. Uh, and that's kind of the general knowledge now. So we talked about our whole industry. Uh, if you imagine a film production, normally it takes years to plan. It takes about one and a half, two years to do, unless you're a Blair Witch. And then it takes time to launch. So it's a long production you plan, but now we're talking about planning in modules. Creating modules, planning in modules, launching modules, and fin also financing in modules. Uh, so it's a whole other world when this starts taking off. We're going to take one last question, and then we're happy you're so many, but that also means we make the break a little longer so you can get out and stretch your legs. You can I also come grab me anytime. I'm here all of today and tomorrow. Ah, the question is down here. Hi there. I'm actually a bit concerned about who is actually allowed to access your biometric data. Because talking about getting data streamed right to your lens, could actually be used to something far more worse if one someone wants to play a prank on you or one hackster wants to scare the living hell of you. Mm -hmm. You can actually put a horrifying picture directly <laughs> to your retina. That's not quite fun, actually. So I'm a bit concerned about who actually should be allowed. Wh wh which level of scary do you want in your field of vision, right? <laughs> <laughs> this one. Okay. Over there. Yeah. So that's actually the most worrying thing, actually, about it. And should we allow ourselves to be monitored because sometimes you don't really know if you're monitored right now or not by the government. I think, um, so you know, that, that's a really uh, contemporary 
question that we have to ask ourselves yeah. every time there's a new technology that we interact with is what trail of data do we leave behind? And how identifiable is that? And you know, what are all of the security risks around that? Um, I don't know if I have an answer. I mean, I, I personally make decisions as I see things. I'm not going to be the first one to stick the contact lenses in my eyes because they might burn my eyes out, right? Like, I got to see someone else do it first and know it's going to work. Um, I'd probably be before a lot of people. I'd certainly be the first one in my family. Um, but I'd still have to have some idea of what it's doing. I think, though, one of the things um, that maybe wasn't completely clear is that some of these are, I'm just trying to, f uh, where's my picture of, so like Nike Plus, everything that's happening with your Nike Plus sensor is happening, as far as we know, um, within a controlled space that you control and you have a password for. As far as we know, they're not aggregating any of that information. Now, if corporations aren't honest, if technology providers aren't honest, then that's of course going to become a problem. Um, but I think you know that's not a question for a content maker. That's a question for a, you know a, a really smart group of international politicians and philosophers. Um, and I think we're all we all have to be responsible and make our own choices, just as we would with any other product or service that we interact with. Right? Would you use a cash point card when you first heard about it? It's like, uh, wait, this thing is going to get money out of the wall safely, and no one else is going to be able to use it. Like that sounds like something you'd be skeptical of, but now we pay for everything with cards, right? Because we we've learned that they're safe, and the corporations that have provided them have proved that they're generally responsible. I didn't just say that banks are responsible on a camera, did I? Um, no, no. <laughs> but um, you know that. But that, that it's that type of learning and that type of interaction. It's small steps. I mean, much like developing the technology of in and of itself, does it work? How do we do that? It's got to be small steps with the security as well. Thank you very much for some very good questions. Let's give Jason a hand. Thank you. Thank you for having me.